Welcome to Selling in the Motor Trade, in association with Automotive Management and Simcoe Training. This is the weekly podcast where we share best practice, tips, and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve your service department, and generally put more profit into your dealership or dealer group. I'm your host, Simon Bokert, or some of you might already know me as Skippy. And firstly, I want to say thank you for taking the time to tune in. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Selling in the Motor Trade. Firstly, I need to start off with a big, huge thank you. You know, this podcast started in the very first lockdown. Do you remember that all that time ago? And we were stuck at home. We couldn't get out and about. And I thought, okay, let's start a little podcast. Uh, It started in our uh, cinema room at home. So that sounds very grand. Sorry. Um, um, Don't think be grand at all. It's just where we'd go and watch movies and stuff like that, as opposed to our our living room. And I kind of set it up to a little mini studio. I thought, well, what else are we going to do? So let's start a podcast. Um, I always thought I'd like the idea of a podcast. Uh, I wrote the book, um, Words That Sell Cars, and that did really well. Now, of course, I was thinking, you know, this might be good for business going forward um, and might just give us a bit of a uh, bit more credibility out in the industry. But it's grown legs. Uh, I just looked at the stats yesterday and the amount of you people that are, are listening to this is just going up and up every single week. It's kind of getting to that snowball effect. And it is really down to you guys, the listeners. I mean, the promoting of this we do is what I do on LinkedIn. So this is all word of mouth. It's people saying, listen to this podcast, go and have a listen to that one there. Um, We haven't got huge budgets like you might have on, I don't know, someone's podcast that's doing a business to consumer. It's just all word of mouth and it really is snowballing. So uh, I just want to say a huge thank you. Also, this episode today is what we call in the business, the, the solos. It's where I'm not interviewing someone. And when we interview people, we get obviously the most listenership, readership. I still don't know what it's called. Okay, maybe you podcast experts can tell me what it is. But it's these solo ones, I get the most direct feedback from salespeople, managers saying, brilliant episode. I sent it out to all my sales team. They needed to hear that. So this is another one of those little solos that we talk about. Okay, don't worry. We're still going to be interviewing people. Um, And, you know, I I love interviewing people because I listen to what they say. And I learn so much about the motor trade. But these solos, they're the ones that I get feedback that sales managers, dealer principals, they play them in their sales meetings in the mornings. Um, And again, I get so many direct feedback on that saying that technique really helped that technique was really good in my sales meeting there so i'm going to ask for a favor um if you like this podcast i I think we're a a hundred of them now go back to the beginning and listen to them all there's so many good little nuggets in there that people have told me that has really really helped them okay um but go back and listen right from the beginning there and also Listen, please um, send a review, send a comment on Apple um, and do me a favor. If you could do that, I'd really, really appreciate it because we just want to get this message out to as many people as we possibly can. Uh, Also, do me a favor. If you do a comment, if you do a review, just screenshot it, direct message me on LinkedIn and, you know, I'll get in direct contact with you and say thank you. And uh, I I send you a personal thank you on that one because I just know it really does help when people take the time to do that. So if you feel that you've got any value out of this, if you could do that, I'd really appreciate it. But anyway, without uh, further ado, let's talk about the solo episode this time. Do you? Or your salespeople struggle remembering people's names? Is your memory as bad as mine is? I'd often joke to clients, and a lot of my clients, if you listen to this, you've heard me say this, I'm kind of like Dory from Finding Nemo. If I don't do it straight away, it's just not going to happen, okay? I have to write it down. Even then, I've got to remember to write it down to make sure I do it. And um, we've got so many different ways to help us nowadays with phones. Okay. We can just speak to Siri or Google or whatever and get them to remind you to do something. But you've got to remember to do that. Okay. My memory is really bad. But names, oh, I struggle with people's names all the time. 
But in fact, when we're running a, a, a standard physical uh, sales training program, we'll often have, I don't know, up to 20, 25 people in a room. And very quickly, I'll remember everyone's name in the room. And a lot of people come up to me and say, Simon, how do you do that? How the hell do you do that? Now, when I first started, as any good sales trainer, is we'd have those tent cards, you know, those A cards where you'd write your name on them. But have you been on that course where you see the poor trainer just looking at the name first and then look up at your eyes, look at the name, then the eyes, okay? It's kind of like a little bit off-putting. Or if you're like me, I've been on training courses before and you swap the tent cards around and they're calling someone by their wrong name, okay? Now, I don't use those tent cards name badges. Now, in the world of Zoom, it's easier because Zoom, they put your name up on the screen, okay? And I find myself being lazy now and using that. I've got to stop that habit and get back to just remembering people's names. And I learned this from a customer. That's right, customer. Uh, I sold him. I could tell you the car. It was a Holden Commodore. It was a Calais model. Now, the Calais was the top of the range car for people who aren't in the Australian market. Okay. And this guy was an estate agent. Now, I was always a young salesperson. I was always, yes, certainly, sir. Yes, sir. This way, sir. Okay, no problem, sir. And it was easy for me being nice and young. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. But it got to the end and he bought the car. I had to fill out the old fashioned order form. You young people been in the industry for a short period of time. Yes, we had to get pen and paper and write out an order form and get them to sign it. And I couldn't remember his name. But I know what you're thinking. We know how to get around that one, don't we? Uh, sir, how do I spell your surname? Isn't it embarrassing when they say S-M-I-T-H? Damn. Yeah, I just want to make sure it wasn't with a Y, sir. Okay. Or this one. You put your hand out and say, sir, I just need your license to fill out the paperwork. So I put my hand out, waiting for the license to go into my hand. And nothing's going in it. I look up and this guy's got a huge grin on his face. And he said, uh, hey, Simon, you can't even remember my name, can you? How embarrassing is that? Okay. You go, oh, no, I, I just need the direct spelling or something like that. Okay. I can't remember this word for it, obviously, because it's a long time ago. Okay. Uh, hopefully I said something witty, witty like, no, sir, but I'm about to give you a name if you don't give me that bloody license. It wouldn't have been. Okay. But he then turned around and said, hey, Simon, you know the person's name is the most important word you could use in any sales presentation. Actually, sorry, I might have that wrong. I think he might have been selling insurance. He was selling something anyway, okay? And I said, I know, but I struggle remembering people's names. He said, we all do. What you need is a process. And he taught me a quick, simple process. He said, repeat their name three times in the first 10 seconds. Now, it sounds like a lot, but actually it's not. Think it through in your head. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Simon, you are? Ah, Pat. Ah, Pat, why are you here today? Are you looking for an X or a Y? Or an X. Hey, Pat, what was about an X that put it on your shopping list? That's three times in the first 10 seconds. It really does help to start cementing their name. But there's something else that's even better. He went on to say, but you know what, Simon? Most people's names are a repeat of someone else's name. So if you want to remember Pat, okay, just say, do you know another Pat? I said, yeah, of course I do. It's my good mate across the road selling used cars, Pat Casey. He said, right, when you look at me, just picture him. So here's a challenge for you. My name's Simon. My middle name is Andrew. Now, someone's going to come up to me at a conference one day and say, Andrew, okay? But here's how you're going to remember my name. Just look at me and say, Andrew, three times, okay? Now, in the real world, you'll say, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Simon, you are, blah, 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 okay? But then, do you know another Andrew? If you know him personally, that might help. But it doesn't have to be someone you know personally. It might be some movie star, some actor, some politician. It does not matter, okay? Just pitch that person. So my name is Simon. Don't just call me Andrew. My first name is Simon. Oh, in fact, uh, the people in Australia listen to this. 
you'll have a bit of a chuckle about this. In the UK, I'm known as Skippy. In fact, I have clients that don't even know my name is Simon. Because I, I left Australia in 95, doing the typical backpacking thing that we Aussies do. Uh, found myself in a Nissan dealership in High Wycombe. And nicknames, everyone gets a nickname in the motor trade. And I got the nickname Skippy. Now, listen, I tell you, it could have been worse because my mate, they call him Rolf. Can you imagine being known as Rolf Harris now? That might be a bit awkward. Okay, so I'm going with Skippy. I'm happy with that. Okay, but I tell you what, for years I was called Skippy. And if I'm brutally honest, I kind of resisted it to start with. Okay, because it was it wasn't a stretch of the imagination. Oh, by the way, if you're under 30, right now you're gonna have to Google Skippy the Bush Kangaroo. Okay. There used to be a TV program on in the early 80s. There's this 10-year-old kid, he could speak to a kangaroo, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, a really cheesy TV program. To explain it now, it's kind of like the cross between neighbors and home and away and lassie. Well, I'm sorry. If you're under 20, I have to explain what Lassie is. Lassie used to be a kids' TV program on in the early 80s. Um, but kind of like Dr. Doolittle, that's a better way. And this kid could speak to the kangaroo. Weirdly enough, the kangaroo didn't even make a, a, a real noise, not like a human Dr. Doolittle noise. He'd just go for the people who remember it. And there's this kid, this 10 year old kid would say, What's that, Skippy? The man stuck down the well. What, you think you need 30 foot of rope? Right, let me go and get it. Okay, really cheesy kids TV program. So I resisted it for a long time. Let me tell a little secret. I now promote it. You know what? I promote it. I promote it with customers back then. I promote it with clients now because they might not remember Simon, but they remember Skippy, the Aussie sales trainer. And over since 2000, we started the business. That must have got me so much business because people can remember Skippy. Okay, it's Skippy the actual sales trainer. Um, in fact, I should really do more of that on social media as well there, okay? But remember people's names, okay? I resisted it to start with, but now kind of use it. Let's get back to your world in a dealership. Just two things. Repeat their name three times in the first 10 seconds and then picture someone else's that you know, okay, has got the same name. So I want you to do this. Next time you see me at a conference, okay, uh, you see me in an airport or something like that, come up and say, ah, it's Andrew is your middle name. See if it works for you. But then try it with customers. Here's the next thing. I personally find the more I do it, the easier it is to remember lots and lots of people's names. When I haven't done it for a while, because the world is all in this remote world now, we do lots of our training via Zoom there. Now, dealers prefer it because people aren't out of the business for two days, three days or whatever, okay? And we have lots of clients saying, hey, we're not going back to it at all. So I find myself getting lazy because, of course, Zoom has got people's names, as I said there. And so you get in the habit of doing it. But also, how do we remember things in general? You see, in our training programs, we cover lots, okay? If you come on our standard sales training program, our selling in the online world training program, our customer's first contact program, our managers, our after sales programs, we jam so much into them. In fact, I had a major OEM in Europe was looking at our training content and they're looking at what we would normally call a one-day course. And a lady who's used to writing training, okay, hi, Debs, said, honestly, your course, we would probably turn it into four days or five days. Now, I personally think that is just not fair on the people going through the training. We put so much into the training course, okay, so people can get the right information. But people always say, ah, but what if they forget it? They will forget it. Well, I'm really proud to tell you, uh, part of the Volkswagen Group, in Europe, we set a target for some of the training we do for one of the brands where people have to have 80% retention after the training program. Now, traditionally, what we would do is um, you give them a little test to start with. You run the one day, two day, three day course. At the end of the test, that, sorry, at the end of the course, the trainer gives them a test again to make sure they got over 80%. You've been on that course where the trainer is 
leading you towards the right answer sometimes, okay? That's because there's so much financial incentive to make sure there's 80% retention. I'm really proud to tell you, we actually got 82% retention after one of our courses. You might think, well, so what? That's not good. But here's what we're really proud about. It was an 82% retention after our training course, 90 days after they went through the program. That's right. It was 90 days after the training program. We still got an 82% retention. How do we do that? Well, firstly, the big part of it is part of micro learning. So we know that trouble with any training course is you train people one month, they forget it the second, and then you go and end up sacking them the third, or they go back to do what they've always done. So after any training program, we actually have a program called Sales Fitness, where we send the people a video a day for the next 90 days, covering different parts of the training program they've been through. They're all bite-sized chunks, because the way the human mind learns, it cannot absorb all of that information in one hit. You have to layer the information. And it's quite interesting. Uh, people who will know me personally, uh, I fly a little light aircraft. Uh, this is proud dad talking now. My son, uh, he went solo on his 16th birthday. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm proud as punch that on his 16th birthday, what he means is he just jumps in the plane all by himself, no instructor, and goes off solo. Do you know how scary that is? Be sitting on the ground, seeing your pride and joy uh, up there in the sky, all by itself. I mean, he could have lost the propeller, could have hurt the landing gear, anything. Of course, I'm only joking, but really proud, okay? Uh, he's now doing his aerobatic rating, or he's done his aerobatic rating. Uh, he's actually got the three-time champion, British champion, uh, teach him aerobatics, okay? And this is just proud dad talking. However, it's interesting to watch the amount of learning he has to go through when he's doing his IMC rating, and that's the one where you can fly in cloud and um, doing, a, he'll do uh, an IR uh, for the, for American Australian people listen to this. Uh, we have an IR rating. It's an IMC rating is like an IR rating, but dumbed down. Uh, there's an IR restricted rating. Anyway, all these different ratings. And all of the instructors are making sure that the training, they're drip feeding it. Because if they give too much at once, it just doesn't go in. Imagine your salespeople's mind is like a sponge, okay? And you've got a amount of more water you want to pour on the sponge. If you just pour it on in one hit, guess what? Lots of it is going to just go everywhere and fall on the floor. But actually, if you pour it really slowly, drip it in bit by bit by bit, that sponge is going to absorb all of the water. So that's what we do. We do the initial training to start with. And then we drip feed in a five-minute video every day that people can listen to on the way to work, okay? They can, um, there's a test every 10 days. Well, we do that on purpose. Why do a test after the training? Every 10 days to make sure there's retention, okay? So that's probably a big part of how we've got it. But also, even on the training course, people have been on it. They say, hey, hold on, Skippy, your trainers do all these funny clicks, okay? And when you're doing that, all I know is, hey, listen, that's just not feasible. How? flexible can you be? And there's these clicks I do all the time. Uh, and I learned this. Uh, and funny enough, this is truth. I can't remember the book on memory skills that I learned this from. That's how bad my memory is. But in our training, okay, uh, we pepper in lots and lots of psychobabble to get our delegates to remember as much as we possibly can. In fact, we go through and the five different ways that people tend to remember things, okay? We remember firsts and lasts. Do you remember the first car you sold? Yeah, you do. It's one of the questions we ask when we interview people. You know what? I haven't had anyone yet who hasn't remembered the first car they sold, okay? Do you remember the last car you sold? Probably did. But you don't remember all the other ones. We remember firsts and lasts, okay? Secondly. Okay, um, we remember things that are different. 
Okay. You might remember the first car you sold. You might remember the last car you sold. You don't remember all the others. But do you remember that mad customer? Okay. That I had one lady. She turned around and said, ah, I have to say yes, because the numbers have told me yes. I said, Sorry. She said, I'm a witch, love. The numbers are talking to me. To this day, I'm a little bit scared, but I remember, okay, her, because she was different. You don't normally get that from a custom buying a car, okay? Um, so remember first and last, we remember things that are different. Repetition, okay? Of course, repetition is a great way of learning things. Is it the only way? Maybe not. Okay. There's lots of different ways, but repetition, think back to school. You went through the times tables again and again and again. But there's also two other ways that work really well. It's called linking and association. So what we've done is, I, I can't remember which one's which, but this is how I um, sort of understand it. Okay. When you want to remember my middle name as Andrew, I've got you to link it to something else, another Andrew you know, or maybe you're associating with someone else that you know. Okay, so linking it to something else you know or association. And there's a technique called memory tagging. Now we can't do it in this environment, okay? Come on our training courses, on our management training course, we'll run through memory tagging with you. But basically we'll put 10 different memory pegs on our body. Start from my toe, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 right to the top of my head. And of those 10 different memory pegs that we've got there, we can attach something to it. You see, this book told me that our memory is kind of like bucket memory. Okay, so what happens is, and on our management course, we say, right, guys, let's see how good your memory is, and I'll test them. I'll run through 20 different things that we want them to remember. And invariably, I run through the list of 20 things, tell them don't write it down, and then write down as many things as they can. Now, some people are better, some people are worse. If you're like me, I struggle. Some people try and spin the story in their head about Michael Jackson as sitting up a tree and blah, blah, blah. I can never spin the story quick enough in my head. And you know what? I'm lucky to get eight of them or something like that. You get some people are really, really good and I'll get the full, uh, you know, 18, 19. We ask them to remember them in order. But then we go around the room and say, okay, guys, let's try this again. Here's 20 different things that we're all going to remember. And you're going to remember them inside out, back to front. And what we do first is we put 10 memory pegs on their bodies. From starting down uh, one is the toe, all the way to 10 to the top of their head, okay? And we put them on in a stupid way, which is different and loud and so forth. And then we just attach what they want to remember to one of those memory pegs. Um, I seen a TV program years ago, a man called Darren Brown. He's the UK uh, magician. I think I want to call him a magician. Uh, he done a similar thing, but he had... Um, 10 different rooms in a hotel, I think, from memory. Uh, and he said he would use it for card counting and stuff he wanted to remember. It sounded like a very, very similar process to the book I read, but I can't remember the name of the book. But in it, I said, how do we remember things? And there's a couple of things they refresh my memory on. Firstly, the TV commercial that got the highest return on investment ever is a gorilla playing the drums to a piece of music. Do you remember what they're advertising? Hey, you're right, Cadbury's. You can remember it, can't you? Hey, when was the first time that advert was aired? Might shock you. Someone told me the other day, it's 19 years now, okay? That advert was first aired. Now, what has a gorilla playing the drums got to do with chocolate? Well, nothing. But firstly, it's different, okay? You've probably not seen many gorillas playing the drums and different sticks in the head. Think through all the TV and radio commercials where they want us to remember things. Yeah, they use repetition lots. Of course they do, okay? But they make things that can't happen in real life. They're different. 
One of the things I get from every person, not every person, sorry, but lots of people come on my training course is, goodness me, they're different to what I thought. Your courses are different to what we thought. And I take pride in that. And I hope they are. If they're not, we need to change them again. Because what do most car salespeople think of manufacturer training courses? Boring, death by PowerPoint, waste of my time, crap. So we want to be different as much as we can. Death by PowerPoint. I urge my trainers not to use PowerPoint unless they have to, have to, have to. So many times we'll drag people up and get them into a corner. Okay, obviously COVID-19 times we've got to be careful and looking around a laptop and people say, what are you doing that? Can you not just put that up to the screen behind you? Get your little secret. Yeah, of course I can. But that's what everyone else does and it's death by PowerPoint. I want to get them up and moving around. We are completely different. I get that from lots of people saying, I wasn't expecting that. But actually, it goes into their mind. They remember it. Back to the gorilla playing the drums. It's different. But also, they linked it to a famous piece of music. Okay? You can hear it now. still in your head, can't you? Phil Collins. I can feel it in the air tonight. Okay, and that music coming in. Okay? Now, it's probably got the highest return on investment because it was kind of cheap to make. I'm guessing that's what it was, okay? Um, it's a guy in a gorilla outfit. But also, it's that famous piece of music. Now, I don't know how true this is. I don't know if these stories have been embellished in time, but I heard as well that they asked participating petrol stations to play that music over the tannoy when people are pumping up petrol. Because doesn't music take you back to a point in your life? I mean, Sheryl Crow, all I want to do is have some fun. Whenever I hear that piece of music, okay, uh, I'm immediately transported back to Townsville, North Queensland, driving down the Strand with a good mate man called Pat Casey, and we're talking about should we travel around the world? Yeah, let's travel around. Should we do it? Yeah, let's do it. And that piece of music come on. And Pat said to me, well, that's an omen. We've got to do that now. We immediately transport that. Music takes us back to a point in our life when we remember something, okay? So this is what they did. Where do most people listen to music nowadays? Isn't it in the car? And often, where do most people buy single chocolate bars? Isn't it petrol four courts? Now, I don't know if they did play that music over the uh, tenor or not. Okay, I've had someone said, oh, we were in a petrol station back then. We never did it. Fine, maybe it's an old wives' table. But actually, I think it probably would have worked if it did, because music takes you back to a point in your life. Okay, that's number one. Number two, how do they get to remember things? TV commercials, radio commercials, they have that funny little laugh, that funny little joke. Because when we laugh, endorphins flow. That makes us feel good. Okay, um, think how many TV radio commercials have that punchline at the end. <laughs> and they do it again and again and again. Because whenever we giggle, endorphins flow. And the way I kind of think that one works is you get people down in a pub or something like that. They can spit out joke after joke after joke. Aren't they brilliant at it? But I'm not one of those people. I just can't remember a joke. Put a gun to my head now. I can probably remember one joke that we all have a signature joke that we just bring out. Uh, but when someone else starts talking about jokes, as soon as they start it, yeah, I remember that one. Oh, no, no, I remember that one. No, no, remember that one, okay? Because when we laugh, those endorphins flow. We remember the punchline, not the joke, until someone starts it and then we can associate it or link it to the punchline, okay? That's one of our training courses. A uh, thing that gets thrown at us all the time is um, we, we put so much humor into it, okay? Uh, if you walk past one of our training courses, physical ones, there's laughter there all the time. In fact, if they're on a Zoom training course and people got the headsets in, people in the background, they're sometimes just here, what are you laughing at all the time? We do that on purpose. Now, here's a little caveat. This is the truth. I am not naturally a funny person. I'm not naturally witty. It's the same silly little jokes I use all the time at the same point because we know if we can get them to laugh, they're more likely to remember that. So number one, Okay, things that are different. Our training courses are different all the time. Number two, okay, uh, laughter. We put lots of humor and laughter in throughout there. Hey, sometimes too much and we got to temper it. Here's a third one. And I also did it in this little spiel now. Have you ever heard the phrase, 
sex cells. Hmm. Again, the way it was explained to me, um, I think it was the famous advertiser, it might be Ogilvy. Whenever I do this, someone always directs messages me and says it wasn't Ogilvy, it was this guy, it was that guy. Um, I, I don't know. The, the famous advertiser I heard many years ago, uh, Murray Walker. Um, Amaza Day helps you work, rest, and play. Apparently, Murray Walker, the F1 man, come up with that. Uh, I was proud of that for years. Someone told me that until I read Murray Walker's book. He said, no, it wasn't me. It was someone on my team. Okay, I'm not going to take credit for that. I was working in the department at the time, but listen, I think it's all credited to him anyway. Okay, it's like this next one. Okay, I, I was told, I think, I, maybe I heard it or made it up in my mind that Ogilvy came up with said, um, we as humans are bred to breed, and that's where it's been turned into sex cells. Don't believe me. Have a look at Christmas time. Every uh, perfume or aftershave commercial, don't they spend millions on these mini movies? They get the latest Hollywood actors and actresses and all that. Okay, they're absolutely brilliant. But you dissect the psychology behind every one of them, it's really simple. <laughs> Buy this fragrance for your partner. You might get lucky. Okay. That is really what they're trying to do. Okay. Now, actually, let's go one stage further with this. Okay. Um, there is a department store in the UK called John Lewis. Again, people listen in Canada, America, South Africa. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for putting up with all our uh, UK quotes. But every year they have a Christmas commercial, okay? And they're like mini movies, okay? The Christmas commercial comes out and it's a bit of an event. And you dissect the psychology about them. The experts will say they're all, we're bred to breed or sex sell adverts. And when you look at them, they're not directly like that, but it's actually the emotional heartstring they're tapping away. And they tie up to a famous piece of music sung a bit differently i'm just thinking of some of them in my head now um, you're always a woman to me there's a famous uh, billy joel song sung by someone different okay so you hear the song you think i know that song but it's been sung different by someone different in a different sort of format acoustic or something like that but it had the image of a young girl growing up into an adolescent teenager getting married having her first children, and then being a grandmother. See how it's through the ages. Um, uh, Lily Allen was singing a Keen song on one of them, okay? And it's all about, I think there was a rabbit and a bear and looking after one another. Uh, there was a man on the moon. It was the young granddaughter image looking through a telescope of a man on the moon. It was the grandfather, granddaughter image. Oh, the Elton John one. I think it was the last one that really had impact for me anyway. It was Elton John, a famous piece of music, obviously sung by him, okay? But he was thinking backwards through his life where he was the old man that he is now to when he got his first piano. Now, again, I don't know this is true, but apparently when that advert was shot, John Lewis didn't sell pianos. What's it got to do with pianos? Nothing. But tugs on the emotional heartstring and people link it and associate with John Lewis. Okay, and it's the emotion side of it. So you come in my training courses. I did it before. I was a bit rude and crude. I hope I don't offend anyone. If I do, there's my apologies. I would be heartbroken if I thought I offended anyone. But if you come in our training courses, we do make sure it's different all the time. We do make sure there's humor there all the time. And yeah, you know what? I'll talk about some menu windows. Okay, I will talk about um, some things to get people to remember things. Because here's a real simple thing for me. If I can get your team to remember more of what we're trying to teach them, they'll use more of it. And if they use more of it, it'll work. And if it works, they'll sell cars, sell parts and accessories and service, okay, and make you a lot of money. And if they make you a lot of money, you'll use this again. It's a real simple approach, okay? So, and by the way, do I go too far on training courses sometimes? Yeah, I probably do, okay? The little benchmark for me, though, is love, actually. 
It's a certificate 15 movie, okay? Uh, if you have a look at that movie, okay, there's not a single word or an innuendo that I would personally use that's not in that movie there. That's my personal benchmark, so I don't go too far, okay? And do I offend some people? You know what? Over the years, I guess I probably have, okay? But I tell you what, it's a lot less than you think because it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And when we explain what we're trying to do and get people to remember as much as we possibly can, and we explain why, and the proof is in the pudding, okay? I mean, 82%, three months after people being on a two-day training course, and I got to tell you, I don't know any other training company that's got anywhere near that sort of retention on a training course. And there's some of the tricks that we use. So guys, um, the tricks, I'm treating you like my trainers today, okay? Um, so there's some of the tricks that we use to get people to remember things. How can your salespeople use this? Well, Number one, go and find a good book on memory skills, okay? And talk about memory pegging. It's personally worked well for me, okay? And these 10 memory pegs that are on my body now, I got down to my toe because I know most of you people are listening to this, okay? Down to my toe is number one. My heel is number two. Number three is my knee. Number four are my parts. Number five is my belly. Number six is my love handles. Number seven is my heart. Number eight is my mouth, number nine are my eyes, and number 10, that's right at the top of my head. So we'll go through these memory tags and we'll put it on salespeople's bodies sometimes. We'll get them to shut their eyes. Then we say, right, what we want you to do is remember the road to sale process, inside out, back to front, without even forgetting it. We get them to shut their eyes and down on their toe, we put attitude, okay? Attitude is on their toe. Number two, on their heel, meet and greet, think your feet. So we say meet and greet, think your feet. Number three is their knee. That is needs and wants. You might know it as qualification. So we have number one is attitude. Number two, meet and greet, think of their feet. Number three, needs and wants on their knee. That's qualification. Number four, are there parts? That's the part exchange appraisal. Again, people listening in Australia, and America, uh, the trade-in is just referred to as a part exchange in the UK and Irish market. So that's why we call the parts as a part exchange. Now on the belly, that's the presentation. The love handles turn into a steering wheel. That's the demonstration drive. The heart, we get them to present their hearts pounding out their body like Pepe Le Pew, the little French love scum. That's the <gasps> trial close. Do they love it? They then use their mouth to the negotiation. And we get them to say, that's not feasible. How flexible can you be? And then the eyes, we get them to close their eyes mentally in their head. That's closing the sale. If they can't close them, like, follow them up. Now, again, I've just done it quickly here. It's not going to work for you listening to this podcast. But we have 10 stages of the road sale process on memory pegs on their body. And they remember inside out, back to front, upside down. And I learned that from a flying instructor. You see... When you're coming into land, you have to do some checks that you can't read from a checklist when you're a single pilot, okay? Uh, you've got two pilots there, you've got someone reading through a checklist, and that's the best way to make sure nothing is forgotten. We have checklists everywhere. In the world of aviation, we have uh, pneumotics. Some of the people listening to this who are pilots, you have uh, Frieda checks. That's when you're flying along, checking the fuel and the engine and blah, blah, blah. You have a hazel check. A hazel check is before you do any aerobatics or stalling. You make sure your height is okay, the airframe, and you're secure and blah, blah, blah. It's everything. It's uh, Pneumonics are everywhere in the world of aviation. Uh, when people come in to do the downwind checks, Okay, um, there's bump fitch is another one that gets talked about all the time. Brakes are off, undercarriage is down, blah, blah, blah. But actually, I had Chris Koppel teach me the memory pegs. And I, I've been flying for 20 years now, okay? When I come into land, I'm still thinking brakes are off on my toe. I can picture but brakes are off. Number two, undercarriage is down and it's locked in three green lights. Number three, the mixture is rich. OK, um, and I'll make sure that in my mind, I'm, uh, there's a mixing bowl on my knee. It's got nothing to do with it, but the mixture is rich. OK, the fuel is on in my mind. And number four, I do a little wee in the fuel tank. It works for me. The fuel pump is on and the carburetor heat is selected too hot. OK, I make sure after that that um, 
Oh, goodness me, I've always forgot this. My, my altimeter is set to QFE. In the UK, it's QFE. I know in Australia, we only fly a Q&H settings for the pilots listening to this, okay? Uh, so that is just the airfield height, how high the uh, airfield is from the surrounding end, I suppose. So QFE is the airfield height, Q&H is regional. But don't, don't worry about that, I'm getting technical. So we make sure the altimeter is set right and we're correct height above the airfield. That's the easy way to do it. Then we'll make sure that uh, there's no traffic on the left and the right and coming into the circuit pattern. Okay, it's all clear there. And then we make sure we're secure, our seatbelts on, our passengers are secure. And then we're going to do a downward check. In my case, it's going to be Golf India Echo, downwind. You know what? I still, when I'm coming into fly, I still do that mentally, just touch the different areas to make sure I've done everything I should do. Oh, here's the other thing I was taught. Uh, my plane, the undercarriage, is bolted down. It doesn't go up. It can't go up. I learned in a thruster for the people who uh, go and Google it. They'll give you a little laugh, okay? It's a thruster microlight. I learned in that. The undercarriage in one of those will never go up. They'll never, ever, ever make a retractable thruster, okay? But my first instructor still got me to touch a little screw on the panel and say, undercarriage is down. The mixture's rich. Again, this aircraft didn't have a mixture rich. I thought, why are you getting me to do that? Because he said, at some point, you'll be in a plane where the undercarriage does come up and down. Okay? And I want you to get in the habit of knowing that you're going to check these things all the time. Okay? Now, there's some science behind that that people say, oh, they're not sure if that works or not because people race through their checks without actually doing them. Uh, but you know what? It was drummed into me right from the beginning. I still can't help it. I still do it. So listen, with this one here, remembering people's names three times in the first 10 seconds, okay? Try the memory tagging, okay? Um, go, go and find yourself a book, get an expert on memory, okay? Um, I suppose we'll just tell you what we do on our training courses to get people to remember as much as they possibly can. Anyway, hope you found some value out of this. Again, if you've got the time to send a comment, I really, really would appreciate it. I'll see you then. That just leaves me to say that all details of this episode and other episodes on the selling in the motor trade can be found on our website, simcotraining.co.uk. Go there to get a copy of our book, Words That Sell Cars. Go there to sign up to a free trial of our sales fitness online sales training program. Easiest way to get hold of me is Simon Bokert through LinkedIn. Thank you.